So, usually what I do is share material that I'm very, very comfortable with. So it may be new to you, but it's not new to me. <clears throat> Today I'm going to do something different. A few months ago, it's fall, um, where are we now? <laughs> it's February, yes, that was fall. I was teaching at Chautauqua in... <laughs> not that Chautauqua. <laughs> <laughs> No, Barbara and I were just at Chautauqua, the, the, the old one. There's another one in uh, Boulder, Colorado. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, oh, you can check that out. And I don't know what I was teaching. I don't know what I was talking about. But one evening, I went out to dinner with some of the participants. We went to this restaurant called Salt. Yeah, so you know that restaurant? It's on Pearl Street in Boulder, Colorado. If anyone wants to go check it out. <laughs> during the lunch break. <laughs> so, sitting in, in salt, and it's just like a you know, long table and people on both sides, and there was a woman sitting across from me, and she said, so what's your next book? And without thinking, I said, the Gospel of Sophia. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> she said, ooh, what is it? I didn't know. <laughs> I had never heard that idea before. <laughs> Which, when I got back to my room afterwards, <clears throat> turned out not to be the case. <clears throat> I actually heard it in a dream the, the night before. So it was in my subconscious, and someone said to me in my dream, the Gospel of Sophia, and then I forgot about it until dinner at Salt and then it came out. So then I thought, I'm actually done writing books. My last book was called Surrendered, and the idea was, besides the topic of the book, was I am surrendered to writing. I am done with book writing. I have other things. I have podcasts, and I write for my magazine that I work for, but uh, spirituality and health, but um, done with books. And yet, I couldn't get this out of my head but I still didn't know what it was. And then I started having these, okay, I'm gonna call them experiences, <laughs> but I'm not sure if that's exactly it. I started having these moments where texts with which I was familiar just started coming into my head. But they weren't coming in in any kind of ordered fashion. And it wasn't just like the title of the text, it was like verses of text, but different texts all in a jumbled order like you wrote them all out and then you threw them up in the air and they came down, you know, and you just said, oh, look, there's something there. So I started writing down what I was getting and that turned into what I think at some point will be the Gospel of Sophia. So what I want to do this morning is I'm going to read some of it to you. And if it sounds garbled, it's because it's just garbled. But I don't really think it is. I think there's a pattern to it. And I'm going to comment on it as we go along. So these are ancient texts from a variety of traditions. The book, if it ever comes into that form, will have footnotes, you can know where they are. I'm not gonna burden you with all the notes. But this first section came from, but it's not, a, none of these are quotes exactly. They're sort of, they're coming through me and then I write, them, I write what I hear as opposed to what the original text said. So this is from Thomas Merton's uh, poem, Hagia Sophia. <clears throat> so this is what I got. Sophia is the unknown, the dark, the nameless essence, manifesting all being and becoming. She is the love that reveals the unity of life. She is life as communion. She is life as thanksgiving. She is life as praise, life as festival, life as glory. Sophia is the mercy of God in us. She is the tenderness with which the infinitely mysterious power of pardon turns the darkness of sin into the light of grace. 
She is the inexhaustible fountain of kindness and would almost seem to be in herself all mercy. She does in us a greater work than that of creation, the work of new being in grace, the work of pardon, the work of transformation from brightness to brightness. She crowns us not with what is glorious, but with what is greater than glory, weakness, nothingness, and poverty. So what are we talking about? Now, who are we talking about? So every tradition has its understanding of the Divine Mother. In the Jewish tradition, or the Judeo, you know, the Jewish Bible and the Christian Bible, the Hebrew Bible and the Greek Bible, you find in the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 22, a very odd thing. <clears throat> Judaism and Christianity, Maryology aside, is overwhelmingly and oppressively patriarchal. Right? If you're sitting next to a man, hit him. No. Don't do that. She's, she's almost in herself all mercy. So just slap him. But it's, I mean, th these religions are overwhelmingly patriarchal. Islam is the same. And they're all the same. All these religions were made by men. And whatever predated them, which may have been from a matriarchy and with a, a mother goddess figure, they were crushed. And thankfully for Catholicism, not crushed entirely, so that you get all these, you get all these goddesses in the forms of, of Mary or something. But in the Bible, on the surface, there's not a lot of feminine stuff going on. You know, you get, you get a god who, who can be loving or genocidally or homicidally, you know, mad. It all depends on whether he's on his meds or not. <laughs> That's how I say, how do you know, you know, what's what, because it's, it's, so I don't, I don't believe in God, right? I don't believe in God in the sense of a God out there somewhere. I don't believe there's a guy supernatural outside the natural uh, universe uh, who creates us, judges us, makes rules for us, chooses you know, one people over the other, go choose. It's not, I don't believe in that God. I don't believe in a God that chooses and, and some people doesn't choose other people. I don't believe in a God who saves some and damns others. I don't believe in a God who separates people by caste or by gender or anything else or, you know, and says these are the true believers and these are the infidels. I don't believe in that God. For me, God is what the Hebrew word for God says God is. Because the Hebrew word, in English, you know, Y-H-V-H, yod heh vav heh in Hebrew, translated in most Bibles as Lord, L-O-R-D, but in most Bibles, many Bibles, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So when you read it, you don't say Lord, you go, Lord. <laughs> if any of you are seminary, you've been through seminary, I mean, I went to, to, to seminary, went to reform school, and... <laughs> because it was in the reform movement. We spent four years learning how to say, Lord. Because <laughs> that was the most important thing to say. Because they knew that no one in the congregation understood Hebrew. So you had to say, Lord. But if you didn't give it a lot of gravitas, no one was going to take that concept seriously. The saving grace is, for most liberal congregations, no one takes it seriously. Because that God is not serious. Dangerous, but not true. So the word that we translate as Lord is the Hebrew yud heh vav heh Y-H-V-H. In German, when they would translate it, they don't have a Y, they used a G, and you end up with Jehovah. So I was walking out here uh, on, uh, by campus the other day, and there were two ladies with Jehovah's Witness, you know, giving out the watchtower and, and trying to get people to join Jehovah's Witness. So I tried to explain to them that it's really Yahweh's Witness. <laughs> but, and they weren't German. I don't know why they would, 
But anyway. But that word is a verb. Lord is a noun. That, the, the actual name that, that is revealed to Moses at the burning bush, this YHVH, is a verb. It's from the Hebrew verb to be. It's the future imperfect tense, which means it's, there's no good translation in English. I awkwardly use the happening with a capital H, happening as all happening, to give the sense that this is all God happening. You know, God is mirabying, and, and God is ramying, and God is ewing, but also God is chairing, and walling, and lighting, and cameraing, and everything is simply the activity of the divine. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, you discover that the activity of the YHVH is feminine. And it's called in Hebrew Chachma, or in the Greek translation Sophia, or Lady Wisdom. The way YHVH happens as all happening is through the feminine. It's like when you see Shiva uh, and Shakti, some statues, you know, Shiva is, is lying prone and inert, and Shakti is doing the dance, even though we talk about the dancing Shiva, another statue. But this one is Shiva is, is inert and Shakti is dancing on him. Shakti is the expression of Shiva. Shakti, Sophia, Chachma, to me they're all the same. The, this feminine power is the expression of this ungendered, unformed source. 